In this short video, I'm going to introduce you to the streptococci, the species of the genus Streptococcus that are, are relevant, in a very general sense, and then we'll talk specifically about the group A streptococci, which is Streptococcus pyogenes. In subsequent videos, we'll talk about group B strep, the pneumococcus, the oral streptococci, and then the enterococci. So what are some basics about the streptococci? Obviously, they're gram-positive uh, cocci, spherical shaped cells. They live as either diplococci or streptococcal chains. You can see in the picture in the bottom right, these are um, encapsulated diplococci, and you can see the capsule around the diplococcus. Uh, and, and like most cocci, they're between half and two microns in diameter. Also, like most cocci, they are non modal and non spore forming. These are all fermentative. All the streptococci are fermentative. Some are obligate fermenters, they're obligately anaerobic fermenters and oxygen is toxic to them. Others are air tolerant and they can handle the oxygen, but they still end up not using it. They still end up fermenting. <clears throat> and then I mentioned the catalase test in here because the catalase test is a nice handle for distinguishing the streptococci from the staphylococci. Streptococci are catalase negative and the staphylococci are typically catalase positive. You've done the, the catalase test in lab, you know how quick and easy it is. And so if we've got a diagnosis narrowed down to uh, either a strep or a staph very quickly with a catalase test, we can identify which we have. The streptococci are part of our normal or resident microbiota. They live on us year round, not just transiently, primarily in the pharynx and in the mouth. And that's why I've got those in black on this image. In gray are other areas that the streptococci can reside, though not nearly as commonly. So the conjunctiva of the eyes, the nose, the skin, <clears throat> the lower intestinal tract, the anterior urethra, and the vaginal tract. Pharynx and mouth, though, when you think streptococcus, that's where you should be thinking primarily. Now, years ago, a woman named Lansfield came up with a system for grouping at least a couple of the major types of streptococci based on surface antigens, based on carbohydrates that are on the surface, that she could bind specific antibodies to. And when the antibodies would bind, they'd light up a certain color. And we still use this system in the lab. Uh, using um, um, immunodetection is a very quick way to identify different types of, of organisms. So according to the Lansfield group, group A and group B streptococci are the primary uh, groups of interest. And we call these GAS and GBS. Group A streptococci are are strains within the genus Streptococcus and within the species Pyogenes. So they are different versions, if you will, of Strep Pyogenes. And they range from uh, very mild, low virulence pathogens to very aggressive, high mortality, high morbidity pathogens. We'll talk about Group A Strep in a minute. In the following video, then, we'll talk about Group B Streptococci, which are strains of Streptococcus agalactii. And we're going to see it has a, a pretty limited um, interaction with humans, um, but a very important one for us to understand. And then there are some that don't lend themselves very well to Lansfield surface antigen grouping system. We call these the non-Lansfield streptococci, but they still have, an, uh, have value and importance in human health. This is the pneumococcus, streptococcus pneumoniae, and the oral streptococci, those that live in the oral cavity. Sometimes these are called viridans streptococci, so you may see that in a textbook. And in particular, strep mutans, strep sobrinus, and strep salivarius are of interest. And again, we'll talk about those in a later video. But for now, let's talk about group A strep. Uh, before we do that, let's finish with this idea of hemolysis. <clears throat> Hemolysis, uh, the secretion of hemolytic toxins, is a very good way for us to distinguish different groups of streptococci, as well as to distinguish certain um, staphylococci, because we know that staph aureus tends to be beta hemolytic, and staph epidermidis tends to be non-hemolytic. The viridan streptococci, if you look at this, this picture here, can be either alpha hemolytic, which is partial hemolysis of the red blood cells, or they can be non-hemolytic, which we often call gamma hemolytic. That just sounds cooler than saying non-hemolytic, I guess. Group B strep, strep agalactii, can be any of them, alpha, beta, or gamma. Uh, and so this test is not particularly helpful for distinguishing the different uh, group B strep strains. Strep pneumonia is almost always uh, alpha hemolytic, and strep pyogenes is almost always beta hemolytic. Right? So that's a, a nice handy tool if we know we've got a streptococcus 
to distinguish the two most common streptococcal pathogens, group A strep from the pneumococcus. Group A strep is beta hemolytic, which is that complete hemolysis you see on the right, and the pneumococcus tends to be alpha hemolytic, which is that sort of greenish um, partial hemolysis that you see on the left. Lots of different types of hemolysis, um, different strains are known for different types of hemolysis, and uh, blood auger for this reason can be uh, helpful, can be very diagnostic. Now let's look at just the group A strep. Uh, we're going to look at some of the virulence determinants first, so the factors, the molecules, the structures that allow group A strep to cause disease, and then we'll look at some of the diseases that it causes. Understand that not every single strain will have every single one of these virulence factors, and depending on how the cards are shuffled, which virulence factors a particular group A strep strain has, that'll really determine what kinds of diseases it causes. Now the first set are antiphagocytic, meaning that they protect the group A strep bacteria from phagocytosis. That's going to allow them to stick around longer, to, um, to expand uh, their population size throughout the body, and so on. M protein is a, a protein on the surface of group A strep that interferes with what we call opsonization. Opsonization is when either complement or antibodies bind to the surface of uh, a pathogen and flag it for destruction by phagocytic white blood cells. Okay? This really enhances phagocytosis. It's a very important part of phagocytosis. And complement is a, a sort of general binding set of molecules. These are proteins that are made in the liver. And they're going to bind to things that look like non-self based on uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, patterns in molecules that are not common within the host. And they're going to stick to the surface. And that's going to draw in the, the phagocytic white blood cells. Well, M protein interferes with complement being able to attach itself and opsonize um, group A strep, so that'll slow down phagocytosis. And we've talked a lot this semester about capsules. The, the group A strep capsule is made of a carbohydrate called hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is also a part of our extracellular matrix, and so when group A strep wraps uh, this capsule of hyaluronic acid around itself, uh, it, it basically becomes invisible to your immune system. Your immune system can't distinguish the, the capsule from self. And so again, it slows things down, buys the pathogen time, and slows down the process of, of phagocytosis. There are a couple important virulence enzymes that can be found in group A strep. The first is streptokinase, relatively common, breaks down clots. So your, your, your blood is going to, as part of your immune response, um, once it has delivered a significant, a significant amount of complement antibody and white blood cells to the site of the infection, it's going to attempt to clot the infection in to keep it from spreading. A strategy that strep pyogenes uses is to secrete streptokinase, break down the clot, and break free from the little prison that uh, your immune system has put around it. And for this reason, many strep infections, many group A strep infections in particular, are systemic infections rather than localized infections. Now, some group A strep will secrete a hyaluronidase, uh, fortunately not very common. Uh, this enzyme is an invasin, meaning it's a virulence factor that allows deeper invasion into our tissues, and it's because it breaks down the hyaluronic acid in our tissues, and uh, that hyaluronic acid is often on the surfaces of tissues in order to protect them from whatever's on the outside in the absence of a, um, a cell wall. <clears throat> so hyaluronidase is an invasin. Group A strep strains that have hyaluronidase are going to be invasive group A strep strains. And then a couple important toxins we see in group A strep. There's a set of toxins called erythrogenic toxins, also called pyrogenic. Pyro means heat, so these are heat-causing or fever-causing toxins. Erythro, as in red blood cells, it causes a flushing or rash, and that's where it gets both of its names. This is a set of toxins that stimulate fever, rash, and potentially even shock, keeping in mind that the clinical use of the term shock uh, is not the way we use it in culture. It doesn't mean surprise. It doesn't mean an emotional numbness. Um, we misuse it. Someone might be in a car accident, and afterwards they're having a hard time thinking clearly or walking, or they might be dazed and confused, and we say, oh, no, they're in shock. Uh, they're not in shock. Shock is when insufficient oxygen gets to our organs, and our organs begin to fail. Um, Clinically speaking, shock is um, is very, very dangerous and, um, and is life-threatening. And so shock, in fact, 
takes a, just as high of a precedence during an emergency as, uh, as bleeding does. Um, so uh, erythrogenic toxins can be very, very dangerous, particularly if they lead to shock. And then streptolysins are a class of, of hemolytic toxins. They are cytolytic or, or toxic against, in particular, red blood cells, white blood cells, and even platelets. And so uh, systemic group A strep infections that are producing streptolysins can do a whole lot of damage in a very short period of time. Here's some group A strep infections. On the left, we've got uh, acute uh, pharyngitis, uh, acute streptococcal pharyngitis. You can see the red spots and then some white spots up near the top. This is what we often think of as strep throat. When uh, someone has strep throat, we can uh, either our immune system can chase it away or uh, with an intervention with antibiotics, we can often defeat it. But frequently, uh, some small percentage of the cells retreat and hide in our system. And I don't know exactly uh, the details of how and where they hide. And then they can reappear in a new presentation, but it's the same species, the same strain. And that new presentation doesn't affect the throat necessarily, tends to cause widespread rash. We call, call this scarlet fever. It's a low-grade fever, widespread rash, and frequently, though not always, you see this uh, strawberry tongue up at the top. Um, if you've got a patient that comes in and, and they've got fever and rash, maybe even the strawberry tongue, but no history of strep throat, uh, you may actually have to try to diagnose whether or not they had strep throat uh, in retro. And that's pretty tricky to do. Maybe they just had a sore throat, thought it was no big deal, allergies or something like that, and they wrote it off, whereas they actually had a strep infection. Um, both of these are, uh, tend to be highly treatable by antibiotics. Bottom right, we have cellulitis, which is uh, a group A strep infection of the dermal layer of the skin. We often see it on the shins, like in this picture. And then this upper right picture should look familiar to you from when we talked about Staphylococcus aureus. This is impetigo. Uh, impetigo can be a Staph aureus infection, it can be a group A strep infection, or it can actually be both. And then finally, necrotizing fasciitis. This is the whole uh, flesh-eating bacteria that you hear about on TV and in the movies. <clears throat> this individual, I don't believe, is living anymore uh, in this particular picture. Um, this is when we have hyaluronidase, possibly collagenase, possibly uh, other um, virulence factors that allow for tissue degradation like proteases and such. Uh, very uncommon combination of virulence factors, very uncommon infection. When it does hit, it can be highly lethal. Uh, I've heard of infections degrading human tissue at a rate of an inch an hour. Uh, and so this is very aggressive and, um, and often only lasts a day or a few days at the most before either, um, either the patient wins or the pathogen wins. So that's group A strep for you. Spend some time learning those. And let me know if you have any questions at all about group A strep infections. <laughs>